All right. Um, so we'll start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. And uh, John, I believe you have our invocation. Yes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we, we, as we begin another academic year, we beseech thee to look with favor upon our schools and colleges. Bless those who teach and those who learn. Keep our students safe and faithful and focused on their work. Amen. Amen. Thanks, John. Very apropos. And we'll move on to uh, today in history. In 1619, the first group of 20 Africans was brought to, a col to the colony of Jamestown, Virginia, and the slave trade, unfortunately, began in uh, hmm. the New World. In 1940, radar was used for the first time by the British during the Battle of Britain. Also on this day in 1940, Prime Minister Winston Churchill made his famous radio broadcast paying homage to the Royal Air Force, saying that Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. One of the most famous quotes in the, in the history of World War II. In 1941, Adolf Hitler uh, authorized the development of the V-2 missile. And the outshot of that is that after the war was over, many of those engineers who worked on that uh, project came to the United States and became the core of the engineering staff that eventually developed the uh, Saturn V rocket that took men to the moon for the first time in uh, 1968. In uh, 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Economic Opportunity Act, an anti-poverty bill, totaling nearly a billion dollars as part of his war on poverty. That was a lot of money in 1964. Uh, today, the government spends a billion dollars like it's lunch money, but uh, uh, so it goes. 1974, President, Vice President Gerald Ford assumed the office of president after Richard Nixon resigned in the wake of the Watergate break-in and cover-up. And finally, in 1978, NASA launched Viking 1 along with Viking 2 a few days, a few days later, which provided high-resolution mapping of Mars and revolutionized the, uh, you know, our existing views of the, uh, of the planets. So... Um, at this point, um, I will uh, turn the screen over here to uh, Adam. Um, Adam, are you, I can see you're muted. Uh, there, I can now? see video. Now, now you're good. So I'm going to so turn the... Uh, Let me introduce my son, Adam. Yeah, if you would, if you yeah, would, yeah. Byron, would you do that? Okay. Uh, well, Karen and I are happy to introduce our son for our speaker today. Uh, just a little bit about his background. He graduated from North Montgomery High School in 2003. He got his uh, undergrad at the Indiana Wesleyan in biology. After graduating there, he spent some time with him and his wife as missionaries in Bolivia, South America. Uh, spent some time, maybe a little over a year there. Uh, when he came back, he went on to uh, get his master's, got his master's degree in Taylor at Taylor University in environmental science. And that's where he's kind of his heart is. Uh, he landed a job with the Cardinal Environmental Consulting. He worked there several years. And now Adam works at the center at Donaldson's as director of ecology relationships for the poor handmans of Jesus Christ. Handmaids. Oh, handmaids, yeah. <laughs> and Jesus Christ at the Donaldson Center. And that, if you don't know where that is, that's just uh, west of Plymouth, Indiana. And he lives in Plymouth with his wife, Becky, and their two daughters, Lydia, nine, and Heavy, five. So, Adam? All right. Up to you. Thank you, Mr. Theta. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, Adam, before you get started, I'm going to mute everybody's audio. You'll need to unmute yours. Okay. Okay, 
guys hear me all right? Yes. All right, so I will open uh, share screen here and play from the beginning. All right, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Well, feel free to interrupt Jerry if something goes haywire, but, um, and what was our, Jerry, what was our kind of target time here before you cut me off? Well, I'm not gonna cut you off, but uh, most speakers talk for, you know, 10 to 20 minutes. Okay. All right, we will probably scoot through this pretty quick then. Um, and I'm gonna share a little bit about, not necessarily the, the nitty gritty of the solar projects that I've worked on, but kind of the larger context that these are happening that would maybe be more applicable to people throughout Indiana. Uh, so I've called this considerations for utility scale solar. Um, and the center at Donaldson is uh, kind of an umbrella for uh, five different ministries of the poor handmaids of Jesus Christ, which is a, a group of Catholic sis uh, sisters, women religious, and their kind of flagship institution there is Ancilla College. Some of you guys have heard of that. So I'm going to, I, I don't know if this is uh, uh, appropriate to do, but I'm gonna just go ahead and straight steal some of the slides from my collaborators here, just because uh, I'm picking and choosing some stuff that's kind of best to, way to communicate this. Um, since joining the Poor Handmaids about four years ago, I've worked a lot with solar energy, both at our institution with two different installations, as well as conversations uh, across the state in terms of the, reg the regulatory environment uh, from the state level and also the county level, and worked with um, on some other, on some project teams for local institutions that did solar. So today I kind of wanted to share where we're going uh, statewide since that's kind of a hot topic. And uh, one of the, we had an online webinar that kind of went over uh, what they call the model solar ordinance for counties. Because of these things being proposed, there's a lot of concerns, a lot of unknowns, as this technology is somewhat new to our region, although the technology is not new. Um, this, uh, this gentleman, Brian Ross, is drafting a, a model ordinance for the state that counties can then kind of pick off the shelf and then adapt for their needs instead of each of these counties trying to start from scratch, which is kind of a kind of an uphill battle. So why, why are we at this juncture? Uh, the main reason is that uh, is economics. And that's, if you, there's one takeaway, that's kind of the main takeaway today is that, you know, solar energy technology has been around for 40 years. We've blasted it off on rockets to power spacecraft, uh, but it was always super expensive. And uh, just in the last 10 years has dropped you know, about 90% and uh, is now competitive with basically any other uh, electric generation in the region. Uh, not only for retail, but also now at the wholesale level, even as the subsidies are, subsidies are being phased out over uh, this next couple of years, but even with the cost of those subsidies disappearing, the cost declines are making up for that. Up in our region, our utility is called NIPSCO, and they've decided to close all of their coal plants simply because it's too expensive. It, in the long run, the physics is that you can't really compete with a free fuel with no moving parts compared to something that you have to dig out of the ground. Uh, you know, coal kind of served that role in industrial civilization, but it, it simply just can't compete. And when these utilities go into the free market and ask for uh, electric service from, from market providers, what they're seeing is that uh, solar and wind and paired with battery is just the cheapest marginal cost of electricity right now. Um, so again, it's, it really has to do with, with markets and economics at this point. Here's a map of the solar installations. Now this is not just large installations. This may be something as small as the one on my roof, which is only five kilowatts or about 13 panels. Um, but you look at the, the map from 2010 to 2020, and you see just how it's taken off. And again, most of that, uh, part of that is the regulatory environment that makes some of these feasible, but it also is just the, the big cost decline. So why is that of interest to, you know, the mostly rural counties in Indiana? Well, it's, it's a resource that we have. We're an ag mostly an agricultural state north of Indianapolis. 
and agriculture is essentially harvesting solar energy through plants. And that's essentially what we're gonna be doing with uh, some of these solar farms as well. Um, for, and you know, the majority of Indiana is owned by private landowners. And so that would be uh, just like you have leases for farming operations, uh, you would have leases for solar operations as well. So some of the, you know, there's a lot of entities right now, and I, I probably packed too many slides for a 10 to 20 minutes, so don't feel like you have to read every line in there because I'm going to be moving fast. But just to demonstrate that there's a lot of local governments that have found this uh, useful, and again, this depends on which, whether you're at a REMC or at one of the big utilities, whether the economics works for you. Um, but a lot of municipalities are doing this. Um, schools are doing it in our region. We have another one in the county that's getting a, a very large solar project. Um, as well as colleges and the universities, the ones that, that I'm associated with, we did one that was about half a megawatt um, or 500 kilowatts. And to our knowledge, up to this year will be the, the largest installation at an Indiana university or college. Um, but as you're about to see, this will be dwarfed by the scale of the projects that we're going to be talking about. Um, and here's a map of municipal and rural, rural utilities. And if you guys can all see that uh, map of the state to the right, that big cluster around West Michigan, uh, Marsh, uh, Montgomery County really is kind of the epicenter for a lot of these mid-scale solar farms. You're talking one megawatt up to 10 megawatts. Um, again, for scale, my uh, project at our institution was half a megawatt. These have been one to 10. Now, when we go to utility scale solar, we're talking 200 megawatts. So you're talking about uh, you know, installations that are approximately 100 times larger than the ones that you're seeing currently going up in Montgomery County. Uh, just to put it in local context, some of you are probably more familiar, but I was just trying to get up to date on that. Um, it looks like the the wind power project has been abandoned in Montgomery County and with the understanding that uh, the agreement was that they would be permitting uh, a process for solar farms. Um, this is an article from last year about uh, CELMP and all their work with IMPA, which is the, um, the kind of umbrella organization for all these REMCs. They have about uh, 30 megawatts and counting and again, for scale, a lot of these utility scale or farm scale projects are 200 megawatts. So it will be one of these projects will be approximately everything that CL, 10 times everything that CEL and P have done so far. Um, to, to put this in the broader context, uh, you see on the right there, there's a map of the United States. Uh, the shaded regions there throughout the Great Plains in the Midwest is uh, called MISO. It is an electric, it's the electric grid that is administered from a headquarters in Carmel, Indiana. That one headquarters dispatches electricity for all of this region. I mean, a huge part of the country. And they are at every second of every day with a high degree of security uh, matching supply and demand on the electric grid. And it really is quite amazing what we take for granted now. Um, you know, you all who have, you know, Grew up earlier, uh, maybe across different regions. My parents, you know, in rural Iowa, uh, power outages were a pretty regular occurrence, it sounded like, and it wasn't like it was turned on within you know, a couple hours. Uh, that really is pretty rare at the moment. Maybe, Jerry, your recent experience being an exception, I don't know what the context for that is, but um, it, it's pretty amazing how they link all these together. And on the left, you can see those are prices. Um, I don't know the units for those, but all of these uh, grid operators are looking on the market, on the grid for power on a minute by minute basis and buying that. So that's the market force that's driving a lot of these installations is that a developer will sit down and analyze the prices. All these prices are public. They can go through and analyze all these and say, okay, is this product that I'm gonna put on the market, I'm gonna make a, a sales agreement with CEL and P. Uh, am I gonna be able to recoup my investment and be profitable? That's basically the, the data that they're looking at. So the things that you, know, you want to do with solar zoning, uh, which it appears that Montgomery County has already done and what we're in the process of doing in Marshall is all the familiar reasons you have for zoning is that you have to balance uh, private property interest with uh, the good of the public essentially. 
uh, and I won't go through all these uh, line by line. But basically, ordinance is doing just that, um, having standards, acceptable you know, standards, setbacks, um, and processes so that uh, people's concerns can be taken into address. And one, one thing, just briefly, like that we hear coming up a lot, and you guys will probably hear a lot now too, is that although wind and solar energy are both considered renewable, uh, they are very, very different from a project footprint. Um, you know, wind turbines unobstructed, you can see for a very long distance. Uh, solar arrays are only, you know, up to 10 feet off the ground. Uh, so the visual impact is far less in terms of the, the area. Um, also, you know, wind turbines have massive foundations, massive amounts of concrete that have to go in the ground. And the decommissioning would be very, uh, you know, expensive or involved, requires specialty equipment, not saying that it can't be done. Um, solar installations, on the other hand, are basically the ones we have are impact driven steel beams um, with no foundation poured at all. And they do these pull tests to make sure that they're, they're you know, wind rated to a certain capacity. But essentially to decommission these, as long as you have all the wiring up beneath the panels, you basically just disassemble everything and pull those uh, stakes up. And then you have, you know, ungraded topsoil there to use for any other purpose that you would if you wanted to decommission this. So that, um, and I don't know if I have a slide for that, but that is obviously one of the concerns of especially agricultural areas is that, hey, this is prime farmland that we're giving up. Um, should not be a consideration. And it certainly is, and it has to be balanced. But for example, in our county, I did some quick math, um, and now just ignoring for a second the fact that you have to trade power across markets and you have to either store batteries at night, but we could produce enough electricity for every household in our county using just one half of 1% of the county surface area. Um, you know, so, these will be massive projects, but it, it's not infinite. Our, our needs aren't infinite. Um, and we have, you know, the, with the advances in agriculture, we're, our farms are producing so much food now, that certainly not anyone is going hungry because of uh, these projects. It's more a matter of um, the financial return for farmers. And what I've heard in researching that is that um, a lot of farmers now have to, you know, just doing the standard corn and beans only uh, the margins are so tight that they have to look for other revenue streams, whether that's alternative crops, whether that's um, livestock. And some of them are saying, hey, I need this marginal soil on this part of my property in order to make this float and be able to pass this to my kids. I need to lease this portion, you know, for a wind farm or what have you. Um, okay, this slide, site, site design elements. So all the things that you would expect uh, for a project like this have to be considered. Um, and that's, that's the purpose of putting this ordinance is that counties, uh, you know, I, I've been in workshops, the American Planning Association has a local Indiana chapter. It might be a Northern Indiana chapter. I don't know if that picks up more Montgomery County, but there are a lot of counties who have gone through this already. So it's not an insurmountable problem. It's not things that cannot be addressed. Um, it looks like I got my slides uh, uh, reversed there. I was gonna put Montgomery County before mentioning those. Uh, but briefly, I'm going to talk about one of our projects, um, and specifically the idea of uh, pollinator-friendly solar. So again, this goes back to the concerns of, uh, you know, loss for agriculture, loss for ecosystem services, like, uh, you know, wildflowers and other wildlife habitat. Is there a way we can improve the footprint of this site to have a better ecological function? Um, do we have to have, you know, somebody out there on a lawnmower just mowing this like a turf grass project, or can we put some low growing wildflower species underneath and get a boost for pollinators? Because as we know, uh, let me see if I get that slide here. Um, you know, this is what a lot of, especially Eastern Marshall County looks like. There's just not a lot of habitat left. Um, and you know the, the landowners are kind of in you know trying to preserve habitat but also trying to produce an income off of their land so is there is there a way that you can kind of get a two-for-one benefit and that's essentially what this new research that we're doing uh, is trying to do is figure out which species are appropriate to plant underneath the panels to enhance biodiversity to improve 
you know, if you take land out of production, you're adding carbon to the soil, you're adding nutrients instead of taking it off. Um, the idea that, you know, 20 years down the road or whenever you would potentially decommission these plants, uh, the soil is going to be as productive as it more, should be more productive than it was uh, when you stopped tilling it, you know, temporarily. So a group of us have put together a technical guide just for this aspect of the solar projects as well. It's for Northern Indiana, but it could apply in many ways to most of the state uh, for the establishment and maintenance of these sites because uh, that raises a whole host of other questions. You still have to do a little bit of maintenance, but the idea is that you're not out there mowing it every three weeks and you're getting some benefit out of it. And there's some researchers at Michigan State University um, that, uh, you know, where there's a lot of berry crops up in, up in Southern and Western uh, Lower Peninsula, those berry crops require pollinators to, um, you know, pollinate their, either their uh, tree nuts or the fruits. And so if you can have pollinators within the vicinity of these fields, you have a, you have a boost in those uh, crops. So um, these are some slides I put together, just kind of showing uh, the number of species that we put in this mix, 42 different wildflower species. Um, seeded, you actually seed it over winter and then it grows uh, let's just skip right to the pictures. Here's what it looks like in year one, not, not really pretty. These are perennials, so it takes a couple years for them to really develop. Uh, but by June, uh, we're already seeing some of the, the, the species start to take off. And there's September, that most of the yellow there you're seeing is black-eyed Susan. And I have a monitoring protocol. I have my background is working in consulting as a botanist and working with plants and, and wetland construction and mitigation. So. Um, the plant piece is, is the part that I like the most about this one. Um, here it is in the second growing season, and the first couple years will look very different from year to year. Uh, but really, again, this is um, a pretty small, this is only a half an acre, but you know, some of these sites that they're uh, proposing are on the scale of hundreds of acres, or even over a thousand acres, over, the, over an entire landscape kind of pieced together through a variety of uh, partners from private private parties who are uh, entering into lease agreements. Um, and so far, uh, after a year and a half, identified 88 different species underneath there, uh, 35 of which are native perennial wildflowers. So that's, um, I thought was a pretty good number this early on in plant establishment, including um, a third to a half of the species that I uh, had planted. And then I just went over a little bit of my monitoring protocol. This is, uh, adjacent to a, a cow pasture, and we had to put fence up to keep the cattle from rubbing up against uh, the solar panels. Uh, but, you know, there's not a lot of pollinator resources available in a pasture compared to what you're seeing right next to it. Uh, so that's just kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, and then I also had broken down this research into uh, whether the you know, the transects that I was running when I was sampling were in the full sun or underneath the shade, because that's another concern. Or are we going to be able to get plants to establish in the shade underneath the solar panels? And so that's uh, research that we're continuing to do. And it looks like I've hit about 18 minutes here. And I just want to show, we'll just show our second phase here. This is um, 1,400 panels that are powering the dorms there and the college. Um, and we're basically replicating the project there. So we're still in the first growing season and we're working with a native seed provider to try to fine tune that mix and see which species will grow with the soils in our climate. So I wanted to leave a little bit of time there uh, for any kind of question and answers that you guys, I know I just threw a whole lot at you right there, but any question and answers for uh, stuff you have on this. And it looks like you might, yeah, have to unmute unmute yourself manually. Yeah, you will have to unmute uh, if you want to ask a question. A um, couple of things. Uh, the one map that you showed of the uh, United States and the big swath across the Midwest and the Upper Plains, Chicago was not included in it or didn't appear to be included in it. Was there, is there a reason that Chicago is not playing? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's such a strange... Um, <laughs> you know, boundary. There's probably all kind of historic, where did I go here? Historical accidents of why that's the case. And I don't know, it includes and excludes certain regions. Uh, you can see the 
northeastern Indiana is in the a grid to the east. So that's mostly uh, Commonwealth Edison, I think, isn't it? It could be. Yep. Um, Adam, are most of these panels? Uh, how do you how do you go about orienting them? Are they fixed, or do they track, um, or do you orient them so that they allow the sun to follow across the southern part of the sky and and mostly be pointed at uh, at the sun all day. Yeah, so there's essentially three different ways you could do it, and we have two of them. Uh, our first project was a single axis tilt. So say this is the sun over here, and we have it here. We tilt it four times a year uh, you know, on, on this axis. So I'm going to be doing it next Monday. I'm going to be tilting it from about 12 degrees down to 37 so that it will get that lower angle of the sun through the winter. I can do that manually just four times. Um, our second phase is fixed, so it's just fixed at 30 degree angle, and there's no you know, moving parts at all. And then one that I saw that was being installed up by I-74 there in Crawfordsville, just east of 231. Excuse me, I forget which road that was off of. It appeared that that one was a, also a single axis tilt, but the rows were oriented north-south, and then the panels tilt east to west daily, daily trackers. Um, and those, those you will get the most production from, but you have the additional cost and maintenance of the moving part and the motor. Um, you know, so there's, that would make sale a sense if you're at a utility scale and you can hire a specialist to monitor those things. It probably wouldn't be a system that I would recommend for a homeowner or a small business who wanted a maintenance-free solution. Does that make sense? And uh, so that, you know, the people that are investing just sit down, sharpen their pencil and figure out which of those, you know, solutions work best for their arrangement. Adam, I like the idea of, of growing uh, pollinators underneath the, uh, the panels. Are there any real cash crops that can grow with that reduced amount of light? Um, hostas. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my dad. My dad's kind of got a, a budding hosta side business, so maybe he would be interested in that. But um, there are people that do uh, some sort. You know, it would be a smaller scale agriculture. You know, what's interesting with ag right now is that you're either getting really big or really small. You have these massive, you know, farms for row crops, or you have really small scale, uh, very lean operations of a single or two people doing greenhouse operations, market oriented. Uh, that are doing some really innovative things. Um, so maybe there's a, a, a space for that. I know it's more common in Europe where sheep farming is more common. You can graze sheep under these solar panels just fine. Uh, goats are too troublesome. They'll chew on the wires, cause problems. Cows are too big. Um, you know, we just, we just don't have much of a sheep industry in the region to make that uh, happen, but there are people who use it for that too. I have a question. This is what I want. The uh, power comes off at DC and you convert it to AC. Where do you convert it? Yeah, so usually there are inverters uh, located on site. Um, either one of our arrays has micro inverters under each individual solar panel, and then the AC power goes out directly supplying the building, or okay. some of the some of the other design is DC pooled into one or a small number of inverters who convert it to AC. And usually the arrangements here, you know, the utility scale solar wants to be located next to a transmission line uh, and feed it straight into the grid from which it could be dispatched to market. What you're doing at your home is converting it to AC and it's going to feed anything in your home before the utility even sees what's happening. So on my house, Right now, the solar panels are running this fan behind me. They're running my computer because they are right into my electrical panel. And when there's excess AC power, uh, let's see if I get this right. It goes back through the meter to the grid, and I, the meter essentially runs backwards, if that makes sense. And I get credits for that. And then if, uh, you know, as night falls, uh, the process switches. So that's, that's my current setup interacting with the grid. Thank you. Adam, economically, um, how much, how many, how many solar panels do you have on your house to 
handle all of your needs and does it handle all of your needs, I guess? Yeah, so my, my house is not terribly large and it's reasonably efficient. So I got away with a five kilowatt system and it covers about 80% of my needs. Um, and so that is, uh, if I recall, to the 13 or 16 panels. Let me um, do the math really quick. Yeah, I think it was 17 panels. Um, and, you know, I, I looked at it the first time in 2016, and it was just like, uh, oh, prices are a little bit too much. In 2017, the prices dropped another 20%. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's not going to keep dropping 20% forever. You have to get in at some point. Um, but when I looked at the rates that we're charging here, the deals I could get with buying and selling through the grid, I was able to get a system essentially for the price of a, of a used car. And it, it, I have an agreement made with the utility for 30 years that I can buy and sell electricity from my uh, solar panels to them at retail rates. Adam, where are the panels being? Go ahead, Jerry. Where are the panels being built? Are, is this something that's, that's built in the United States or are they coming from overseas? Are they coming from China like, like most other electronics do? Yeah, it's um, pretty much worldwide. There, there was some, uh, I know within the last couple of years, there was a, an extra tariff that was placed on, uh, on imported panels, which shifted it a little bit. Um, but like with so much of you know, the manufacturing, I, I believe a lot of them are made in China. The good thing is that is there are some, you know, there's like tiers and quality control such that it's such a commodity now. It's not really a highly, how can I say this? It's not a highly sophisticated, you know, piece of equipment. It, the, the basics of it is pretty simple. So it's mostly in the, in the quality of the construction. And, and there's, you have a company that goes through the quality safeguards. You can pretty much, uh, they're pretty much a commodity now, I guess you could say. They're pretty much commoditized, which is good in terms of the market maturing. But there are some, I, I believe in Georgia, there's a pretty, pretty large uh, solar panel Mac, solar panel manufacturer that we were looking at for our last project. Adam, I was wondering about the We lost your mark. Can't hear you, Mark. If you if you can hear me, you can type your question in the chat if you can find the chat function. This is Morris Mills. Um, probably most of you know, but uh, the big power line that runs from Indianapolis to Terre Haute runs through our area, and uh, it's vacant. No power filling it right now, and the uh, developers are hanging around like a bunch of buzzers over a dead horse. I mean, uh, there will be some big units built in southern Marion, in Montgomery County now. Adam, uh, Brian Donaldson here. Not a yeah. uh, solar question, but I've, I've not heard of the center at Donaldson before. Do you, why is it called that? Well, I don't know if, uh, unless you have a connection to the little town of Donaldson, Indiana. Um, that's basically it. It's located next to this uh, small little village with a post office called Donaldson. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Just right off uh, US 30 as you're going across from Valpo to, to Plymouth, basically. I'll have to check it out then. Yeah. Stop on by. Adam, can you um, unshare the screen so we can uh, sure. see rid of the uh, participants? Congratulations, Brian. Maybe you've got some interest in that little town. Adam, you should mention that uh, your solar panels also provide fuel for your car. Yeah, we have. Uh, we've been working on some electric vehicle infrastructure as well at the center, um, and that's particularly good for fleet applications. So we have uh, a variety of institutions that have to run into town and back. It's about eight miles, run over to Valpo, 40 miles over there. Um, 
fleets like electric vehicles because they're typically looking at total cost of ownership um, and they're laser focused on that and their routes are fairly predictable. You know, my brother-in-law works in HVAC. They have a territory. They're not going to, you know, Chicago. So if business owner knows exactly what the use case is for that, an electric vehicle that starts every day, you know, with 200 miles of range, basically is uh, very predictable and the cost is essentially equivalent to about a dollar a gallon. You can fuel it with electricity. It's, just, it's like buying it for a dollar a gallon and it, and it doesn't change as much as gasoline does. So we've done some electric vehicle charging uh, as well at our workplace. Adam, are mostly the projects uh, individual or for a specific building or specific, like a campus or something like that? Or are they these large uh, projects that you see like CELP is building out on, uh, on 150 South? Uh, I guess the answer to that is yes. All of the above, I would say. Um, the thing that's very different also that I didn't mention about solar and wind is that wind has a very a uh, big economy of scale. You know, as you go up, you know, with wind, if your tower is twice as high, you don't get just double the wind, it's something like four times the wind. You know, and as your rotor gets bigger, um, so the utility scale wind, they don't put tiny little wind turbines on everybody's, you know, backyard. They put those massive ones in because that's what makes it work. Solar panel is essentially the opposite. There's not a lot of uh, util or, uh, economies of scale other than just bulk purchasing because they're modular. You know, one solar panel has an out, a known output of a given voltage and a given watt that you hold up against, this, you know, towards the sun. Uh, you have 10 solar panels, you have 10 times the electricity, you have 100, you have 100 times. So other than bulk purchasing, there's not those uh, economies of scale. So it'll work for a church uh, on a small scale, it'll work for a massive farm on a utility scale. And that's uh, generally good news compared to to win, and I think the advantage is once the technology gets to the place where the batteries, the batteries are also coming down in price to the point where you can see these, you know, a package of solar panels with batteries starting to make sense in more and more locations where they hadn't previously for people who are, you know, installing, uh, you know, generators or, or want to have some backup power. Adam, I've always wondered about um, solar panels. What kind of maintenance do you have to do on them? How do you keep them clean? Uh, you know, so that they're they're generating the maximum amount of uh, power. Um, yeah, the um, the idea is to there's no moving parts. So as long as you have quality components and it was installed correctly, there, you know, I've had the only maintenance I've done on mine in three years is I had to reset my internet router. And then I had an issue with resetting the password because my inverter is connected to my wireless internet so I can track my production day to day, which you used to not even be able to do. So they still would have produced even without that. Um, there's not a concern about dust out here just because of how uh, rainy it is in the Midwest. That it, that's more of a concern as you get into very drier regions. Um, so other than that, there's not I think on the larger installations and the inverters may have filters that need to be changed out once a year, but the home systems, once they're up and running, they generally run until they fail, which is hopefully not for a very long time. Um, in regards to the limitations, uh, especially as a backup source of power, I mean, uh, there is a huge difference between, you know, a sunny day like today and a cloudy day in December. I mean, there's a difference of like 10 times. It'll cut the production by 90%. On a cloudy day, say in December, cloudy short day in December. So you start to run into limitations if you want to do an off grid system with a battery backup. If you got, you know, a foot of snow on it, um, it's not producing any power. You know, so what a lot of homeowners will do is if they have a ground mounted system, especially with the tiltable ones, you can tilt it up really steep in the winter and most of the snow will start to fall off. Or if it's even close to the ground, you, know, you just take a soft bristle broom and just brush it off. Uh, what we, that's what we do at one of our sites. Um, and you, don't, you, you only have so many of those snows per winter that you have to deal with. But those are some limitations and that's why these big uh, farms are part of an integrated whole and then that 
operator from Carmel can send and dispatch power across the Midwest and Great Plains based on where it's sunny, where it's windy, uh, what resources are online. I mean, even, even coal plants have to shut down. When I toured a coal plant in Michigan City, it was not even operating because I had to shut down for maintenance. So, you know, the benefits of coal is that you can kind of run it, you know, 24 seven, but you still do eventually have to shut it off to do plan maintenance. So the grid operators have a, a very tricky job. You know, I, I just saw on the news that California is facing rolling blackouts uh, because there's this heat wave across all of the Southwest. Um, you know, there are limitations to solar panels. I mean, that's, that are, there are limitations, but it also, it, it's not a simple explanation. The grid is a very, very complicated thing. So it's not enough to just say, well, it's the solar panel's fault. Um, there's a lot going on with the California grid. And now, unfortunately, they got wildfire fires too. Uh, and those will take out, you know, power lines if you're from your power stations. Adam, what does a hailstorm do to the panels? Depends on how big the hail is. <laughs> um, hopefully we don't have, you know, we, we have these systems designed for, uh, you know, I think the ones out at the college are to handle 90 mile an hour winds. You know, probably if they were in the worst hit parts of Iowa when that windstorm came, you probably would have seen some damage. I mean, there is an upper bounds to the limit. And the problem is, do you design a, do you design a system for that 1%, you know, Generally, no, you try to get 99% of the scenario. So it'll handle reasonable amounts of hail without any problem. Does a solar panel have a, uh, a life expectancy? Does it fall, does its output fall off as uh, it ages or does it remain reasonably constant? The manufacturers have two different warranties. One is a, just a failure warranty to just guarantee that it won't fail. And another is a production guarantee. So these can range from 10 to 25 years. Um, but the production guarantee, you know, these, these panels will degrade over time. And generally, you know, the kind of bar right now is like less than half a percent per year. So over 25 years, you will have a reduced output, but they should still be producing. Uh, but the best ones will be engineered to really physically last and produce energy for probably 30 plus years. Um, but the, you know, the economic landscape and technology is going to change so much by then. It's hard to even say whether those, you know, those may be sold off uh, to individual homeowners for, you know, and do it yourselfers for pennies and they may install like the next generation, you know, here in 10 years would be my guess. Any other questions out there from anyone? This is more as good. I think there's, if you read in the internet, there's some enormous projects in the, the uh, Arabic Peninsula. I think eight, nine thousand acres. I mean, just you can't count. Of course, unlimited sun, and mm -hmm. uh, that may be the replacement for oil down the road because it's these things generate tremendous amounts of power. Yeah, there's a saying. Um... There's a saying that the Stone Age didn't end for lack of stones. Uh, you know, I, about 15 years ago when I was in college, everybody's worrying about the end of oil. And you guys remember how expensive gas was in 2008. And, you know, that has, it's a very complicated international market about deploying oil rigs and everything else. We're going to run out of oil. And fortunately or unfortunately, I, it doesn't look like we will. Um, we're probably going to cook the planet faster than <laughs> if we burned up all the rest of the oil anyway. We have to uh, voluntarily, pretty much through economics now, we'll be transitioning away from fossil fuels. But it'll, it'll take you know, over the course of the rest of my working career to, to kind of do that. But essentially you can't, I, I don't see this getting ever reversed really because you can't be free. Once we have the technology, as long as we you know, don't enter a dark, a dark ages and lose it all, um, it, I can only see it getting cheaper and more effective. Now, whether that will be on your rooftop or whether out in a solar field, that will depend on the economics of how the utility wants to do that. Um, but like, like Morris said, there's these massive, massive farms out in the Arabian Peninsula uh, because, you know, these, those countries there that have built societies in the desert, it's all oil money. And if the oil markets, you know, we, we just saw the oil markets crash here a couple months ago. 
And that's just done a number on their economy. They, they have no future if that's, uh, you know, their only input. And they have to input a lot of their energy. You know, if you, if, you know, in, in the Midwest, we have a very diverse mix of, of energy. We have natural gas deposits, coal and wood and everything else. Some of these countries like Japan has almost no, uh, for example, almost, almost no uh, oil and gas deposits and have to import nearly everything for their economy. So they have to be very careful with their, you know, strategic relationships. Anyone else? If not, um, Adam, thanks very much for a, a very interesting presentation. Um, might be something worth uh, considering here at, um, you know, in Montgomery County for uh, for a number of us, particularly if it's becoming as um, affordable as it uh, apparently seems to be. Um, and certainly the renewable part is something that, you know, we should all be interested in, whether it's it's wind or, or solar or, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, thanks for joining us. And uh, Byron and uh, Karen, thanks for having him. <laughs> um, next week's speaker will be uh, Jamie and Travis Harrington from um, Reclaimed by Grace. And um, my closing thought for the day is the beautiful thing about life is that we never reach an age when there is nothing left to learn or see or to be. And with that, I'll say goodbye for this week. We'll see you all next week, okay? So long, everyone.